Coming up next on News Depth, dive to the bottom of the Philippian Sea to check out the world's deepest shipwreck. Japan's famous cherry blossoms are in bloom and they are early. Nick's got the details on dictatorships in this week's Politics on Point. Plus, pockets in pants, please. That's the plea of this seven-year-old. News Depth is now. A magnificent motorcade of mummies makes its way through Egypt. Hello everybody, I'm Rick Jackson. Thank you for joining us. A grand parade was held in the city of Cairo to move 22 royal mummies to a new resting place. And the celebration was more than just a little lavish. The remains were recently moved from the Egyptian Museum to the newly opened National Museum of Egyptian Civilization, a few miles away. They'll be on display later this month. 22 mummified kings and queens plus 17 royal sarcophagi rode in the Pharaoh's Golden Parade. Amongst them were King Ramses II and Queen Hasbahat. The vehicles they traveled in were specially equipped to keep the delicate mummies intact during travel. According to the British Broadcasting Corporation, the decorated cars had shock absorbers and the streets were repaved just to make sure it wouldn't be a bumpy ride. Chariots, a military band, and a 21-gun salute, all part of this big event. The funerary procession even followed ancient Egyptian rituals in which prayers and spells from the Book of the Dead accompanied the mummies. Egypt's president, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, greeted the mummies at the new museum and called the display evidence of the greatness of the Egyptian people. Wow! Sticking with archaeology, Egypt is not the only spot for fascinating finds. The ocean holds plenty of neat artifacts, including a deep water discovery in the Philippines. We've got access to the first full view of the deepest shipwreck ever found. It was a U.S.-based crew that did it. They've mapped and filmed the entire wreckage of the USS Johnston. It's the first complete survey of the site. The World War II U.S. Navy destroyer has been resting about 6,500 meters down, that's four miles, in the Philippine Sea for nearly 77 years. It sank after losing a key battle with the Japanese Navy. Ivan Watson takes us there. This is the world's deepest known shipwreck. Located more than four miles or some 6,500 meters below the surface of the Pacific. The numbers 557 identify it as the USS Johnston, filmed for the first time underwater by a remote-controlled submersible. This destroyer was one of several U.S. Navy ships sunk battling a vastly superior Japanese fleet during a furious battle off the coast of the Philippines during World War II. These little ships fighting a desperate battle for time. Used everything in the book to stay afloat. How did you feel seeing the ID numbers of the USS Johnston? In a way, it's um, painful, uh, but in another way, it's inspirational. Former U.S. Navy Captain Carl Schuster says he and his fellow officers studied the story of the Johnston and its commander, Ernest Evans, the first Native American naval officer to be posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor. He moved without orders. He saw an imminent danger to the fleet, and he moved on it on his own authority. Evans bought time for vulnerable American transport ships by attacking a fleet of 23 Japanese warships. His actions started a charge, if you will, that ultimately saved several thousand American lives at the cost of his own and, and much of his crew. 186 crew members, including Commander Evans, died aboard the Johnston. The Johnston was mapped by Caledon Oceanic. Over the past decade, several other World War II wrecks have been discovered in the Pacific by expeditions led by the late Microsoft co-founder Paul Allen. Navies around the world treat these sites as sacred war graves. I see them as the tombs or cemeteries of brave men who died fighting for their country, whether they're German, Japanese, or American. The mapping of the USS Johnston brings some closure for surviving relatives of the ship's crew. A grateful people will remember their names. The Gambia Bay, the USS Cole, the Johnston, the Samuel B. Roberts. But the final resting places of the three other ships sunk during the same deadly battle have yet to be found. Thanks, Ivan. Our war with Japan is long past, but evidence of a new battle in the country has surfaced, and it's a problem we told you about last episode, climate change. 
Last week, we mentioned the impact in Russia. That just goes to show climate change is a global problem. In Japan, it's the famous cherry blossom tree showing signs that things are changing. The trees are extra sensitive to shifts in the weather. Sensitive means quick to respond to small changes. The trees are only in full bloom for a few days each year, and this year that spectacle came sooner than in the past. Experts say this fits into a pattern of early flowering in recent decades, and it's likely the result of climate change. Selena Wang reports. Cherry blossom season is coming to an end in Japan. For thousands of years, these flowers have been revered, celebrated with Hanami viewing parties. Even during COVID-19, people have gathered from all around to enjoy these stunning sights. These blossoms, which only last a few days, are a reminder of fleeting beauty, but also of the lasting effects of climate change. Cherry blossoms have bloomed exceptionally early across Japan. Scientists say it's a sign of global warming. In Kyoto, Blossoms peaked on March 26. That is the earliest date in more than 1,200 years of records. Here in Tokyo, flowers reached peak bloom on March 22nd, the second earliest date on record. Now, these cherry trees are extremely important for climate change studies because of how sensitive they are to temperature change and because of just how far back the data goes. <laughs> Yasayuki Aono, a researcher at Osaka Prefecture University, tells me he's gathered records from Kyoto back to 812 AD from historical documents and diaries. In the last 200 years, the peak blooming day in Kyoto has been getting earlier and earlier as temperatures rise, he says. Higher temperatures and urbanization contribute to earlier blooming times. This spring has been unusually warm in Japan, he says. Traditionally, Sakura season is celebrated with picnics and parties and festivities underneath the trees, but they've been restricted this year because of COVID-19, with signs all over like this one reminding people that parties are not allowed. Cherry blossoms hold important cultural significance in Japan. They appear throughout Japanese literature and poetry. It's a symbol of life, death and rebirth. Here in Roppongi, the petals have all fallen the delicate blossoms replaced with green leaves, reflecting the fragility of nature and of our planet. Thanks, Elena. In 1912, Japan gifted several cherry blossom trees to the United States as a symbol of friendship. They were planted in Washington, D.C., and even those trees bloomed about a week earlier than usual this year. Which leads me to our poll question for the week. We want to know what signs of spring have you observed in your neighborhood? Head online to choose any of the following new leaves on trees, flowers in bloom, more animals out and about, or people doing yard work. Hmm, I've seen all four. I guess I should check them all. Well, how about we pause here to see what you had to say about last week's show. We ask, which Beverly Cleary books have you read? And 61% of you said you've read The Mouse and the Motorcycle. Another 44% of you have read the book from the Ramona series. And wow, you guys are just major bookworms. But we didn't just ask about reading, we asked you to do some writing too. We wanted you to persuade us to take care of the environment. Let's see what you had to say by opening up our inbox. Cohen from Jackson Intermediate in Hebron wrote, Hello, did you know that trees can provide oxygen and they can provide homes for small animals like birds and squirrels? It's true, but trees are being cut down more than ever. And while most people don't know that, the more trees we cut down, the more animals lose their homes. And without trees, all the carbon dioxide we breathe out won't be turned back into oxygen. And soon enough, we wouldn't be able to breathe at all. Not only is this a major problem for life on Earth, it will be a problem for the whole planet. So in conclusion, this is a major problem that needs fixing not just for our betterment, but for the world. Here's one from Destiana at McCormick Middle School in Wellington who wrote, We should clean out the oceans because people are just throwing trash anywhere. And if you do that, animals are dying. And if animals die, we will have less food. And young kids will not get to experience what we have experienced. And that is why we should save the ocean. Jesse from Preston Elementary in Cuyahoga Falls wrote, Climate change is important to take care of because glaciers are melting. If we let glaciers melt, places will flood. We will have to figure out how to live in a different way. Kay from Hickory Ridge Elementary in Brunswick wrote, Here is why you should take care of the environment. First of all, if we don't take care of our environment, popular animals can go extinct. I would be so sad if my favorite animal went extinct. Next, you take care of our environment by not driving vehicles all the time. Any vehicle that has gas in it can pollute the air, which is not good for any living thing. 
The last thing is that climate change is real, so please do your part of protecting our environment. Finally, Thailand from Talmadge Middle School in Talmadge wrote, I think we should take care of the environment. I think we should take care of our environment because animals are dying. And if animals die, we wouldn't have meat for food and we would have plants to eat. But I know that nobody would want to eat plants for the rest of their life. But I know that we should take care of the earth because that is what we were supposed to do. And that is our responsibility. Thailand, I don't know about you, but I love spinach. That's a plant. Anyway, good writing, everybody. Speaking of persuasive, did you hear about the seven-year-old whose persuasive letter to Old Navy has been getting a lot of attention? As part of a class assignment on how to write persuasive letters, Cameron Gardner wrote one to Old Navy about girls' jeans. The girl from Bentonville, Arkansas, was annoyed that the front pockets on kids' jeans were fake. She wrote to the retailer saying she'd like to have real pockets in Old Navy's kids' jeans because she'd like to put her hands in her pockets. Logical enough. Old Navy liked the idea and wrote her a thank you note. But the big box store did even more than that. They sent her four pairs of jeans and jean shorts with real pockets. And Cameron and her classmates learned an important lesson about the true power of persuasion. Well, from pants pockets, let's pivot to the possibility of pandemic-inspired passports. Ah, well done. A growing number of states are coming forward with their own plans to use so-called COVID-19 vaccine passports. A passport is something, typically a document, that gives you the ability to go somewhere. Usually, passports are a document from the government that shows your citizenship and it lets you travel outside of your country. But these vaccine passports are different. They would show whether or not someone's received the COVID vaccine and if they're allowed to go certain places. Think about going to big events or traveling when you'd be in contact with lots of people. It might kind of feel nice to know that everyone around you has been vaccinated. But the question is, does that go too far and does that invade people's privacy? Nadia Romero has the details. COVID-19 digital vaccine passports quickly becoming a divisive issue and raising privacy concerns. And as some states figure out how to implement them, tech giants are teaming up with health organizations to make their digital COVID pass a reality for consumers. This is a way for people to get back to our new normal in a safe way. The Vaccination Credential Initiative has teamed up companies including IBM, Microsoft, Salesforce and Oracle with the Mayo Clinic and the Commons Project, a nonprofit with the vaccine passport app currently working working with some airlines. You get your vaccination or you have your COVID-19 uh, test, you're negative. If you have a smartphone, you download it onto your um, Apple wallet or your Google Pay um, and you store it in there. But not everyone is on board. While the companies say no location or medical data will be stored on the apps, that concern might raise concerns for potential users. There's also equity concerns. Fred, not everybody has a smartphone. I have lots of patients with flip phones, with those little burner phones. The Vaccination Credential Initiative is playing a key role in developing U.S. standards and guidelines for these digital health passes and says it's up to each community and institution to decide how to use the apps. Thanks, Nadia. Well, while several states, including New York and Hawaii, embrace the ideas, others, like Florida, have moved to ban the passports. For this week's write-in, we'd like to know your thoughts. Are vaccine passports a good idea or not so good an idea? Be sure to justify your answer with some support. Now, passport or not, the more people who get vaccinated, the closer we get to herd immunity. Herd immunity, you've heard of this before. It's when enough people are immune to a disease that the cause of the illness, whether it's a virus or a bacteria, has a hard time spreading. Thus, people who aren't immune are also protected from becoming sick. But you need a decent percentage of immune people to reach that level, which is why one Hawaiian island is excited that it might be the first spot in the United States to achieve that level. Eddie Dowd has that story. With a population of roughly 3,000 residents, state officials are eyeing this island as the place that could be one of the first in the country to reach herd immunity. The fact that we could, you know, allocate so few doses to this population and protect it, insulate it from this virus, is fabulous. It's, it's an awesome feeling, you know, it, it, it put Lanai on the map. Mass vaccination started here in March, according to the state. 2,300 residents are over the age of 15 and eligible for the vaccine. So far, at least 65% of them have received at least their first shot. That's just 15% away from getting to what scientists consider herd immunity levels. We wanted to see for ourselves just how they're reaching that goal. We are now making our descent to the island of Lanai, where I am told there's only about 30 miles of paved road, no stoplights. 
Once we landed, getting to the mass vaccination site was just a 15-minute drive located in Lanai City where the majority of the population lives. When we arrived, we saw people as young as 16 years old getting their shot. It feels good getting the vaccine. I hope we all can go back to normal, how the world is. Any, any questions at all? It's here we met Dr. John Janikowski. He is only one of two doctors who live in this remote community. For the last year, he's been holding his breath, knowing the island does not have the resources to handle an outbreak of COVID-19. He's now breathing a little easier because he's seeing many of his patients showing up to get vaccinated. State Senator Jay Kalani English and Representative Lynn DeQuay, who represent the area, say what's happening on the island gives them hope for the rest of Hawaii. Why not inoculate one whole island, right? That if we can do it, let's do it. It feels really good, and hopefully Lanai can be the example to the rest of the island. Aloha can also mean goodbye, and it's something the people of Lanai are hoping to be able to say soon to COVID-19. Aloha, Eddie. Let's take a spin around the globe to see how vaccine distribution is going for our southern neighbor, which is Cuba. Hola. Welcome to the island country of Cuba, located where the Caribbean Sea, the Gulf of Mexico, and the Atlantic Ocean all meet. This tropical and lively country is home to just over 11 million people, many of whom live in the capital city of Havana. The country is a socialist republic run by the Cuban Communist Party. This has given them a kind of rocky relationship with the nearby United States. Cuba opted to make their own COVID vaccines rather than rely on supply from other countries, and they're getting pretty close to rolling them out. They are in phase three trials for one of their homegrown vaccines. The government there says it'll need millions of volunteers and that most adults in Havana could be vaccinated by May. Patrick Oppmann has more details. These are the first of an estimated 150,000 Cuban frontline workers who will receive one of the island's homegrown vaccine candidates. Ida Martinez is a dentist sent by the Cuban government to help stop the virus's spread. We've been working this whole time, she says, in testing at the airport in isolation centers. We are people who are at high risk. This will give us more protection. Cuba is the first country in Latin America to develop two vaccine candidates that have advanced to the final phase three trials. The government said it couldn't afford to compete with richer countries for a limited supply of vaccines and that a biotech industry first started 30 years ago by Fidel Castro was the island's best chance at controlling the virus. Cuba has bet everything on making its own vaccines. There really is no plan B. But if the vaccine candidates live up to Cuban scientists' predictions, this small poor island will be on the cutting edge of vaccine research. Cuba says its vaccines will comply with international standards, and eventually the island hopes to sell or donate their vaccines to other countries. But as the number of cases remain at record levels here and the economy is plummeting, Cuban officials announced a far wider test of their vaccine candidates that would involve millions of volunteers. With this expanded study, just the vaccine candidate, not the placebo, will be administered, health officials said. Even if Cuban officials don't call it mass vaccination, they hope the campaign will bring the virus under control. Vaccine experts consulted by CNN said that by carrying out mass vaccinations before Cuba had completed testing, the island's government risked wasting valuable resources and eroding the public's trust. Officials at the clinic we visited said testing had already proven Cuban vaccine candidates were safe and effective. We are all convinced, she said, the vaccine works and it gives immunity. The Cuban government says its universal health care system is one of the triumphs of the island's revolution. That system has suffered during Cuba's economic crises, though, and now may face its greatest test yet. Thanks, Patrick. Now, Cuba has a pretty unique form of government. They're a dictatorship. So far this season, we've explained democracies like ours, monarchies like Great Britain's, and now it's Nick Castell's turn to give us the details on dictatorships. It's time for this week's Politics on Point. Nick. I'm in charge now, and I'm going to tell you what to do. Okay, maybe not, but if you would kindly listen for a minute as I explain dictatorships, that would be great.
A dictatorship is a form of government in which all the power lies within one person. Some power can be shared with others close to the dictator, but the overwhelming majority of power resides with that one person. Dictatorships are notorious for being scary, evil, and dangerous, but they still exist today. If it sounds like a monarchy, that's because the two forms of government have a lot of similarities. However, there are some characteristics that set the two forms of government apart. Dictators tend to take power and not let go. They don't look out for their people's best interests, whereas a monarch does, or at least is supposed to. A dictator may claim that's what they're doing, but their actions usually tell the truth. In fact, they usually take a different title because they don't like being called a dictator. One of the most well-known examples of this being in World War II, when German dictator Adolf Hitler was referred to as the Führer, meaning guide or leader. Hitler ordered the murders of millions of Jews, including citizens of his own country. Living in a dictatorship doesn't sound pleasant, so you may be wondering, how do they start and how do they stick around? There are plenty of ways dictators have risen to power, but a large number of them result from violence, taking advantage of a need for change in the country. In times of need, countries will sometimes give up authority to a singular leader for a time in order to settle a problem quickly. While it may have been the intention to be temporary, dictators can take advantage of this power in certain instances and hold on to it. Dictators hold on to their power by suppressing their people. They limit rights and only allow people to have information that they want them to know. This can include propaganda. Propaganda is any misleading information that's used to promote a political cause or view. This can be anything from lies about a country's well-being to fictional stories about a dictator and their supposed greatness. Because of these reasons, it can become confusing when a country is truly a dictatorship. Normally, outside countries will be the ones to label nations as dictatorships because of the lack of influence dictators have on citizens other than their own. Some of the most notable dictatorships have sprouted up in just the last hundred years. During and after World War II, the world couldn't help but focus on the cruel and unbelievably tragic dictatorships of Germany and Russia. Germany was controlled by the Nazi party, led by the aforementioned Adolf Hitler, and Russia was at the time known as the Soviet Union and controlled by Joseph Stalin. Numerous crimes against humanity occurred under both men's lead, and yet many were still led to believe that they were each great leaders who would bring prosperity to their respective countries. Still today, dictatorships continue to rule over various nations without truly being recognized as one. Some use different labels, such as communist state, to distinguish themselves from being a dictatorship. As history shows with all forms of government, it's important to be aware of government officials and know when they have abused their power. Thanks, Nick. And by the way, that wraps up our series of politics on points about the major forms of government. You can go back though and watch all of them on the News Depth website. Hey, and while you're there, maybe check out these awesome students. Time for this week's News Depth A+. It goes to Mr. Grawl's fourth grade class at Lomond Elementary School in Shaker Heights for taking extra steps after a virtual field trip. Now, the fourth grade students studied various ways to express themselves with a cultural perspective. It could be through stories, music, art, or dance. Because of this, they participated in a virtual field trip to Cleveland's Playhouse Square. That's where I am, actually. Well, they saw a performance called Five Days with Step Africa and learned about step dancing over the course of five days. According to Step Africa, during step dancing, the body becomes an instrument using footsteps, claps, and the spoken word to create complex rhythms. Over the years, it's become a way for African Americans to express themselves, especially during their times at universities and colleges. They really enjoyed it, but it didn't stop after the last performance, shared Mr. Grawl. The students who were learning in person made their own dances, and as other students returned to school, they were also taught the dances. Some of the students even told their parents about it and learned that they too had participated in step dancing at college. It was a real community builder for us, Mr. Grawl said. The students are so interested in step dancing now that many of them are even going to use it in their final fourth grade project. In fourth grade, the students work on an in-depth collaborative inquiry project that applies what they've learned since kindergarten. This year's students will answer the question, what will you do to make the world a better place? Students will create an art piece that represents their answer to that question, and a few of them are going to use step dancing. Again, that's Mr. Grawl explaining. 
Well, this week's News Depth A Plus Award goes to Mr. Grawl's fourth grade at Lomond Elementary for taking their learning beyond just a fun field trip. Okay, how about we see if Newscat has stepped up to the task today of finding us a good animal story? It's time for Petting Zoo. Hey, Newscat. Thought you were hard at work, not just lounging in the sun. Step to it. Okay, she's typing fast this week. Looks like she knows right where she's headed. Aha, I see. She's found some bears waking up from their winter naps at an Alaskan zoo. To find out about the special pandemic protections the zoo is taking to keep the other bears and the animals safe, click the petting zoo button right there on our website. Thank you, Newscat. Of course, that's going to do it for us, but a reminder, our end of the season survey is on the News Depth website. Teachers, we'd love for you to fill it out. Your input is what helps us make News Depth better each and every year. And as a thank you, we will be choosing a couple of classes for a virtual or maybe even an in-person visit next season. If you're not a teacher, we still have some questions on that survey for you as well. Okay, you know the drill. We want to hear from you. And there are plenty of ways to stay in touch. You can write to us. We're at 1375 Euclid Avenue. That's Cleveland, Ohio. Our zip code here, 44115. You can email us at newsdep at ideastream.org, or you can tweet us. Our handle is at newsdepthohio. And thanks for joining us. I'm Rick Jackson. We'll see you right back here next week. News Depths is made possible by a grant from the Martha Holden Jennings Foundation.